whenever you're ready. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. Yes. So I'm going to, um, no, I just said thanks. Okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with the, um, the land acknowledgement. The State University of New York at Oswego would like to recognize with respect the Onondaga Nation, the people of the hills or central fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Sunni Oswego now stands. Please join me in acknowledging the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora nations, their elders both past and present, as well as the future seven generations yet to come. Consistent with the university's values of diversity and equity, inclusion and social justice. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to cultivating relationships with Native American communities through academic collaborations, partnerships, historical recognitions, and community service in order to dismantle the legacies of conquest and colonization. Uh, welcome. I don't know if you could hear, but you know, <laughs> my, my son was yelling uh, at, at me on the other side of the door, but um, that's the 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 ebbs and flows of um, being able to join y'all from Zoom or on Zoom. And uh, welcome to everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I, in, I prefer starting with the land acknowledgement, but in this case, it also means a great deal. Um, I don't know how much of y'all know about uh, wampum. Wampum is not Indian money. Wampum are shells made they're really they're beads made from the shell of a quahog and they're in white and purple or various shades of white and purple and when strung together sometimes they're jewelry sometimes they're meant to um relay a message sometimes they're meant to um sort of um you know, be an ornate fixture of some kind of regalia or ceremonial piece. But wampum belts were created in order to commemorate specific and important events. And there are hundreds of belts that were created. So these belts are part philosophy. They are part... Um, literature they are part art they are part sacred text um, this belt over my left shoulder for those of you who can see me um, this is a very um, ubiquitous belt throughout new york state it's hiawatha or is what my onondaga friends say iowinta's wampum belt and it was made about a thousand years ago to commemorate the coming together of the five nations. The five nations who are mentioned here, Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and then the Tuscarora actually joined later. So they're not represented here on this wampum belt. And you'll see this, um, it's become a sort of symbol for the entire Confederacy, whether it's a flag or it's on a bumper sticker or a t-shirt. You'll see many Haudenosaunee people even have this tattooed on their own body. And so I come to um, accessibility and I come to um, actually finishing, um, as Crystal, you're beginning, <laughs> my term as the uh, um, representative from the CLAS as the accessibility fellow from 2022, but I come to accessibility sort of through the lens or through the funnel of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm the director of Native American studies here on campus, and I teach classes in both Native American studies and anthropology. This wampum belt, is my, my if, if I could have a personal favorite, this is my personal favorite. It's the um, called the dish with one spoon or the one dish, one spoon belt. 
And there are many different interpretations of what these belts mean. I'm just going to talk about a few. There is a, a practical interpretation of the dish with one spoon belt. It is quite literally an ethic of consumption. We are a community. Uh, we're not a community. We're these weird, you know, bricks <laughs> in the Zoom space, yes? But uh, uh, if we were, you know, living under this you know, philosophical and religious principle of community, um, as long as there was one dish, we would all eat. As long as there was one spoon, we would all eat. As long as there was one food stuff, we would all eat. Food is not meant to be commodified and for sale, for profit. Yes, food is meant for um, consumption by the community. Maybe some of y'all have heard of the, the principle of the seventh generation. And that's like um, how I've been told about that is like, you see, you walk on this earth, like you see faces coming up from the ground. You walk upon this earth, you consume, not for this generation, but for seven generations yet to come. In fact, when Haudenosaunee people were living by this principle, they would actually eat crops that were seven generations old. They would store food for seven years so that they would always be eating, yes, then that cycle of the seventh generation, the seventh generation of dried crops. So that's like the um, the practical interpretation of the dish with one spoon. It is a ethic of consumption. But there is also a, an institutional interpretation of the dish with one spoon. This isn't just like how people move about the world. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy is a political entity, right? How can you put the structures in place? to feed the community? How, as an institution, can you ensure that everyone is being fed, that everyone is being fed the same amount, that everyone has the same access to food, to food commodities? That's your role. That's your role as an institution. Yes, this confederacy, this um, installment of 50 clan chiefs. How do you put the structures in place to feed the people? Uh, but today, I'm going to talk mostly about what I think is the built-in accessibility interpretation of the dish with one spoon. What would it look like for everyone to eat. And in our cases, for this afternoon, what would it look like for everyone to learn with one dish and one spoon? I don't know how many of you have uh, worked at or have small children who uh, <laughs> go to uh, elementary school. And there is always like the cheesiest posters on the wall. Like they all come from like, there's just the most horrible company just um, about, you know, inspiration or education or library or the alpha, whatever they are. And I don't know who creates these. And I worked for many years at the Onondaga Nation School. And they have different posters. <laughs> you know, they have all Native American themed posters at the Onondaga Nation School. And many of them were Haudenosaunee specific. And outside the cafeteria, sure enough, they always had this symbol. They always had this sign, the dish with one spoon. And so as I navigate through accessibility, that's what I meditate on. What would it look like? What would the experience be like for everyone to learn from the same pot? For everyone to have one dish and for everyone to have one spoon. So the title for my talk today is going to be Accessibility for the Inaccessible. 
how do we approach then the fact that our students need resources How do we approach that our students need resources that might not qualify for them on paper? How do we begin to approach this massive block of students who either, well, I'll get into it, for one reason or another, don't have the paperwork on file in order for them to get the accessibility services and this accessibility resources to even know what they are on campus. I don't know if you've, um, how much you've experienced this on campus or how much you've um, thought about it, but I wanna talk my talk will be briefly be um, divided into three. First, I want to talk about um, the responsibilities of faculty or what I think are the responsibilities of faculty to this um, silent majority of inaccessible students who need and require and are entitled to our services. Then I want to go through a few case studies uh, particular students who stand out in my mind. And then I would like to hear from y'all, either in the chat or going off um, off mute and speaking into the space about either um, successful experiences that you've had navigating these tricky waters or um, case studies, yes, student anonymous students, yes, that might stick out in your mind of pivot points learning points, um, reflection points that maybe stick out to you as well. We won't call them failures. So um, the responsibilities of the instructor. It's definitely fair to say that many students, uh, some with mild levels of disability, have never gone any form of diagnostic checks, of diagnostic tests, tests in their entire lives. And it is not faculty's job to diagnose them. <laughs> it is not faculty's job to suggest testing, but that they undergo testing in any way, shape, or form. Like, it, it, it's so far out of my realm of an area of expertise that this is not something that you should even think is a, appropriate, necessary, or, or needed. Even though, even though uh, many students, some with major levels of disability, have never experienced an individual education program or an IEP, either at um, elementary or the high school levels, whether they have a diagnosed or undiagnosed condition. These are just the the facts, and, and, and it's not our job, it's, sorry, it's not the faculty's job to create an individual educational program. I think I have like maybe 150 students per semester, and maybe 10% of those students um, routinely submit one of the accessibility forms. So I'm not creating 15 individual educational programs for these students each and every semester. It's just beyond, it's beyond the scope of my abilities um, to reach that many students on an individual level. Maybe some of you are. I, I haven't really considered um, such a selfish person. <laughs> I haven't really considered exactly what um, everyone's unique individual experiences are, but it would be interesting to hear if some of you are tailoring these programs still. I think many of you um, probably feel this though. 
that, that too many students feel a certain level of shame surrounding their learning disability, surrounding their attention deficit disorder, surrounding their mental illness, or surrounding their psychological and psychiatric conditions. It, it's, it's beyond this, this presentation to really know where this comes from or what the influences are that make this such a widespread and ubiquitous um, part of, I think, American culture or contemporary American life. But this is not the sole per reason, but this, um, this, this shame, this, this inability to... Um, access needed resources is systemic it's institutional so as part of that institution as a as a cog in that machine what is faculty responsibility well from what I've learned over the last year of serving as the accessibility fellow, it is the faculty job to cultivate an atmosphere wherein our students feel comfortable to request what they need, regardless of official disability status within the university. But how do you how do you do that? How do you reach students? who on paper or, or not on paper need help, um, need accommodations, need to be told what the possible resources are at their disposal. Bear in mind that... Um, Many of us teach large sections, 30, 50, 100, 200, 300 students. So I want to go over just three case studies of mine, three um, ways in which I was able to navigate and reach successfully, I think, the inaccessible or ways of navigating a system that leaves uh, students without paperwork, otherwise voiceless in their concerns and in their needs. So, um, case study number one, and we'll call this one the assignment submission. And the modality for this class, I think it's important. Uh, the, mo the modality for all of these classes is important. The modality for this class was a bicronus online course. And so what that meant for me is that I would um, deliver content to students asynchronously, a collection of pre-recorded video lectures with supplemental reading supplemental videos along with their weekly reading materials. And then we would meet once a week for discussion. The assignment in those type of classes was to write one activity, one discussion paper per week. And that would usually be due after their discussion section. So during one of these um, Bicronus online courses in the academic year of 2021, um, those weekly activity assignments were posted for the entire class to see. I had learned previously, <laughs> pre before Zoom University, I had learned about the difficulties of having students actually required to respond to their peers and how kind of um, tedious that becomes week after week after week. So I didn't require that, but I wanted if students were interested to be able to hear from and interact directly with their peers, which many of them, again, this was 2021, 
academic year 20 to 21 um, that we're struggling with. I never considered that that would be a, a, a problem or an issue of concern or might cause someone in the case of my student a great deal of anxiety for their work um, for their written work, for their thoughts and their ideas, for a little bit of themselves to be put on display. And this was a, a course of a hundred students. So to, to be put on display for a hundred people to see. That that was extremely disconcerting for my student. So while this student had a diagnosed learning disability, while this student went through the effort each and every semester of um getting the doctor's note and going through the paperwork and have and being on on file and then submitting the paperwork to me stating exactly what her um accommodations were for the entire semester there is nowhere in that accommodation letter that says um assignments should be private right or private submission of assignments or um Public access to work is unacceptable. You know, most of those sheets, nine times out of 10, maybe eight, maybe four times out of five, um, most of those sheets, what they say is the student gets somewhere else to take the exam and they get either time and a half or double time in order to complete the exam. Um, sometimes they say um, student should have access to computer. Uh, during the class, or sometimes they say uh, a student should have access to uh, the front of the classroom, or a student should have to be able to get up and go around, or walk, walk around, move around during class. But I've never seen something about the avenue of assignment. Maybe this just seems obvious to you. It seemed obvious to me. Me and this student, she just submitted her work for the rest of the semester via email. Not even go through, it was Blackboard then, but I've trained my mind to say bright space now. and All my syllabi say bright space now. Uh, so I'll just say bright space, not even to go through bright space, just to email her assignment directly to me. And I would email back to her, confirmed, received assignment number three. Concerned, uh, confirmed, received assignment number four. And that's how we handled it from there on out for the semester. That's the easiest of the three examples, for sure, of the three case studies. Uh, case study number two, which I maybe is the trickiest, I thought was the trickiest, or maybe it's just remembering the case study itself. Uh, synchronous in-person class. Uh, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, normal uh, weekly class with a student who I had had I think twice before, at least once before, uh, a repeat offender, as I lovingly refer to my students who I've seen in multiple courses. And they took an exam, and I had never really experienced this before, and it was an all-written exam, and there were 10 prompts. And when I graded this student's exam, they had received something like a, I don't know, 67 or 68 out of 70. But that's all they had completed, right? There was no other, the three other prompts had been left blank. And so uh, the student, I had the student, I, I talked to the student after class and I said, do you, do you know the answer to the rest of these prompts? And you ran out of time, or did you just not know the answer and this was all you could do and you submitted it? And they said, no, I know the answer to all the questions. I, I wouldn't have written just as well about the last three as I did the previous seven, but I ran out of time. But, it, but it's not that I ran out of time. It's that, and look, I, I'm, not I'm not diagnosing this student. There, like, there's something, uh, maybe it was like, um, some kind of PTSD 
there is something about the noise of the classroom, the, the noise of the students coughing, the noise of the desks moving around that really made it so this student found it extremely hard to focus and could not finish the exam. Uh, this student has, has, I don't know, one or one or multiple, I, I don't think it really matters, diagnosed psychological conditions. This was a, a non-traditional student, someone who had come back from many years of trauma, previous years of trauma in order to finish their degree, but had never gone through the steps with the university in order to prove what their conditions were, in order to ask for more time, or in order to um, advocate for their own, it's, not, it's what they're entitled to, advocate for what they need and what they are entitled to. My guess is that is that's because it was re-traumatizing. To have to do that in the first place, and, and certainly to have to do that at a semester, every semester, semester to semester basis uh, in order to go through this process. And it had gotten them so far. <laughs> they were able to complete 70% of the work, right, at a very high level. Uh, so later that afternoon, me and that student sat down and... I don't know exactly what facilities you have access to, but the anthropology department has access to this one. Like, it's like where the anthropology club meets and watches videos and drinks coffee. It's like old, old couches, even older, like AAA manuals, no windows. Like on one of the, I'll say it's room 206 of Mahar. So you don't know what room 206 of Mahar is because nobody knows what room 206 of Mahar is. It's one of those interior rooms. And I got the key from the secretary and uh, me and this student just sat in there for, I don't know, a half an hour or an hour. I can't remember what it was. And they finished the exam to completion and, and er earned, you know, an A instead of a C or a D. And so I thought about that and then I didn't know exactly what to make of it. I didn't know exactly what my responsibilities were. I didn't want to be intrusive, but I certainly know that this student produced and had earned an A, even though that wasn't what it was in the first 80 minutes of their showing on the exam. So for the final exam, I asked that student if they would prefer to take the exam in that full one-on-one -on -one environment. Uh, just sitting in that room 206 of Mahar and complete the exam that way. At which they jumped at the opportunity in order to complete the exam in the same amount of time, but just in the quiet of a solitary classroom. And they put a... <laughs> Even, even went to the extreme of putting cotton in their ears, right? To like kind of funnel and, and focus like just on the task at hand. This was not a time, this did not like, this is an accommodation I made, but it was finals week. And I just sat at the desk and grade, like it was just a, a, a session where I would otherwise just be grading or a session that I would otherwise just be um, prepping during finals week. I just sat with this student and they completed their exam. Actually, upon reflection, this was actually the first class I had with this student. But then we did the same thing uh, the next semester or the next year. And by the next year, there was a student um, who was in many of my classes, another repeat offender who had epilepsy. And even though they weren't, um, their paperwork wasn't all formalized and institutionalized either. 
even though they too had a diagnosed psychological condition and it had been on the record before, but just, you know, that last semester, it wasn't on the record. Uh, another student had begun to join us for that quiet time exam, or as I have here, the solution was a completion of an exam under optimal conditions. Again, this I'm not I'm not, I'm not saying how where do you where do you draw the line, right? That's not the point of this talk. Or how do you know when you know that this is appropriate? This is just one of the um, case studies, and soon I'll ask what your case studies are. Just this is just one of those case studies that I consider a successful navigation. To sit in a quiet office and be able to take an exam. Last. And um, this has to do with this. I've seen this in multiple formats, actually, even though I didn't include one. I did not include the um, English as a second language student. But content delivery, this case study, during a, again, during a synchronous in-person class. This is one of those forms because this particular case study, this student, their uh, disability was diagnosed and their accommodation sheet had um, the ability to record lectures during class. But because the class is discussion heavy, that was one of the issues that not everyone's voice was coming through on the recording. And because there are were so many different voices that were participating during class, that the student found it very hard, both in person and on the recording, to filter the particular knowledge and the particular notes and the particular terms and terminologies that they needed to be responsible for, that they needed to be learning and reviewing and going over on a weekly and monthly basis. So that the lecture notes or that the notes from class were being sort of lost in the sea of discussion. So their recording, their recording class was unhelpful. I've also heard this from foreign students, from foreign exchange students, from Eng uh, English as a second language students, that recording of the class um, is difficult, isn't as much of a help as they thought it would be. So certainly I do not have this for all of my classes and none of them are up to date. Well, one of them is up to date. But this was a particular upper division course that I had previous that I teach once a year and that I had previously taught a few times. And I had definitely taught during a Zoom University. Yes, when we all became bricks for the first time, we all started thinking about what our background of our bricks should be for the first time. And so I had a plethora of pre recorded videos that still roughly lined up with what I would be teaching that semester. Certainly it was the three books still that I would be teaching from that semester. And it's not the exact same uh, content. It's not the exact same slides. It's not the exact same focus that um, I was gonna be doing in class. But what I wound up doing was simply giving this student access to those pre-recorded um, Zoom videos that I had cut a year or two previously. So in those 10 or 15 minute segments of just, you know, me looking at the, I wouldn't look at the camera like this. I still don't look at the camera like this because it's just a little bit too awkward. Um, me looking at the camera or me looking at one of my slides and talking over it for 10 or 15 minutes or me looking at an image and talking over the image for 10 or 15 minutes. 
that um, for this case study, that for this particular student, it's not going to work for every student. But for this particular student, that worked a lot better. Um, that part, maybe it was, you know, maybe it was seeing the background. I don't know. <laughs> maybe it was um, the ability to just pause. Maybe it was the subtitles, right, that go alongside with the video, as opposed to just listening to that mass of recordings. Whatever it was, this was best for this particular student. Um, this helped this particular student, even though it's not in the um, not in the paperwork, right? But this was the accommodation that um, most successfully navigated this student's accessibility concerns, their accessibility needs, their accessibility requirements. So I'm going to ask y'all in a in a moment what I, and I'm not I don't have solutions I want to hear your 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 ebbs and your flows your peaks and your valleys when it comes to assessing the inaccessible but I began by talking about the uh, a pra one practical interpretation of the dish with one spoon one institutional interpretation of the dish with one spoon and for the last 20 minutes or so i've been talking about a, an accessibility or an accessible interpretation of the dish with one spoon i want to leave you just now with one mythical understanding of the dish with one spoon and that is the earth is quite literally the dish and all of you, all of us, every human has one spoon. Uh, some of us don't get a shovel. <laughs> Others don't get a, a thimble. Uh, nobody gets a dump truck. Not even Lord Bezos. Uh, you don't get to consume in terms of dump trucks or thimbles. All of us have one spoon in which to take from that dish, in which to take from the earth. So I try to imagine our students each with one spoon. Yes? If the university is that dish, and each one of our students have one spoon, then it is our re responsibility to fill it to the top. It's our responsibility to ensure that each student gets an equal amount <laughs> and each student gets, uh, shall we say, a full spoonful. Okay, right on. Casey, your, your awkward yellow hand is up. So <laughs> maybe you could uh, take us in another direction. Uh, not quite another direction just yet, Michael. I had a question with your last example. Um, I'm kind of curious, is there any reason not to make those recordings available to the entire class? Even if it's a different, different from the conversation that might occur in person, is anything lost from the alternate information? I didn't say it, Casey, but I did after that. <laughs> I, 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 it, it made it so obvious, the, the experience made it so obvious that I had them. So I don't have them for all the classes, but for the ones that I do, they are now. Okay. Oh, I mean, it's the Zoom space. So like I, you know, you can use your, your awkward yellow hands or you can like, uh, you can type in the chat now or you can go off mute and speak into the space because I want to reserve so, this time for, for a discussion. So Mike, I can kind of give you one example that I've encountered and it was actually with our graduate program and teaching assistants. Um, we had a, a student who was really very regularly mixing up directions. And what I realized um, at various points was they weren't reading well. And when they wrote notes on the board, either during our TA meetings or 
uh, even in some cases during class teaching lab, there were major spelling errors. They were flipping letters. They were flipping chemical equations, um, creating some confusion amongst the students, but also creating your own confusion. And if you talk to the person, they were fine. They, they were understanding it, they were so forth. And as it was going through one-on-one -on -one at one point with the student trying to clarify a particular experiment and realized very clearly they weren't understanding the directions because that they were reading. And they even at, then at that point after they'd written something made a comment that they're always flipping letters. And that, you know, they get confused a little bit by that. And, um, you know, their dad did this. And I, at that point, I felt like I had the opening to actually ask if the student had ever been tested for a reading disability. And the response was, no, there are such things. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. And here they're, they're there and they're fifth or sixth year of college, you know, they're in their master's program and they're just now learning that there might be some help available to them. It just was like, but I understand what your, your initial part of your examples are. It's difficult and tricky for us as faculty to, as we recognize some of these things, to find that opening to bring it up. Cause you don't want to just jump on it with them and them get defensive or put off or um but that's one example where I had you know I did get that ability and they just had no idea that there was a possibility <laughs> that there was testing and it might be something like that. I've had very similar uh case uh, situations Casey and it becomes really tricky to navigate um, those waters um of how to not it's almost like because of I don't know. I don't know if shame is the right uh, word, but um, to, to say this is not <laughs> this is not a problem, and there are resources, but there are resources here at your disposal that you should have access to. Yep. Hi, Michael. Um, I uh, first of all, your last solution by sharing out the Zoom class was a great idea. One of the things that Star and I recognize is that documentation is a barrier for many, many students. Trying to, you know, they all come from different schools, have different experiences. Please just send that student to meet with one of us. Um, I always tell them the same thing that, you know, you walk through our door, we'll have a conversation. What you do next is up to you. You don't have to do anything. Um, but just because a student doesn't have documentation doesn't mean they can't receive accommodations. Okay. Um, Thank you. Process. Thank you. Cause I, I did not know. I did not know that. Yep. Uh, it, it is, it is a credible barrier for some students. So yes, please just send them our way. Um, would be happy to sit down with them um, and discuss and just have a conversation. Uh, <clears throat> Neither one of us, Star or myself, will admit to how long we've been doing this, but um, a long time. So uh, we've, you know, we've met with lots of students. We'd be happy to help in any way we can. Uh, you know, as far as a professor having to create any kind of an IEP or a 504 plan, we're not asking that. All we're asking is we'll provide the accommodations. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to us and then we can work through. Um, we're all pulling in the same direction, I hope. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I hope I I hope I didn't come off as a kid. I hope you didn't think that you were the you were the institution. You, that you were the symbol of the <laughs> yes, institution. <I, laughs> that your Zoom square was the symbol of the institutional the shady no. Moloch institutional structures to which I was referring to. No, I, I no, I didn't take it that way at all, Michael. I just one of the things that Star and I say regularly is that we need to do uh, more outreach um, and things of that nature, so we can answer any of those questions. Because, as you said, and you've been doing this a bit, um, you weren't aware that if a student didn't have documentation, 
No, I mean, we need to, to do more outreach. So if you have questions, if your students have questions, and I know it's on the syllabus where you say, if you have a disabling condition, blah, blah, but this way we can point them in that direction. But no, no offense. Cheers. Uh, yeah, Donna, your, your awkward hand is up. <laughs> Hi, um, I teach in the graphic design department. And we often have critique where students go to the lecture side. And <clears throat> I usually ask them to leave their phones, their computers to the other side to, to keep the um, distractions down. I had one student who brought her computer over anyways. And, <clears throat> and I did have accommodations for her, but her accommodations did not, she just needed extra time. And I think that was the only accommodation we had, but she actually had a very um, distinct vision problem where she couldn't see the screen. So she needed her, cause I always post everything that I'm lecturing in addition to lecturing, I'll post it in the Google Classroom. She actually needed the computer to be able to <clears throat> um, see what I was le lecturing about and Unfortunately, I had to call her out and say, well, the computers should be over there. So she had to come up and tell me that, you know, she she needs that. And then I apologized. I said, I'm sorry, I, I read your accommodations and I didn't see that. So I don't I don't know how um, when they get accommodations, if there's any way we could have as faculty be have more spe um, specifications like that that could help avoid situations like that. Uh, Donna, if I may follow up with that, um, yeah. why why don't you allow the computers on the other side of the room with the students? Because I don't know if you've ever stood up and presented and you have everybody's face in the computer. That's very distracting. So student presentations are going on. Right. So they they are not allowed to have them over there. If they tell me that they want to take notes or if there's things like that, then I will make accommodations. But more than likely, they're oftentimes they're shopping or doing other things that they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> so it, it's a, it becomes an issue. So I try to discourage them bringing things over. A lot of times students will take notes on their phone or things like that. But I also present, when I present and the students present, I, I, start off telling the students that all the material, especially if I'm lecturing, all the material that I'm talking about is in a video recording and in a slide presentation available to you in the Google Classroom. I would prefer it be more of an interactive discussion. So I would actually prefer they not necessarily um, have to take notes if possible so that they can go back and, and utilize that information later. So that was the only time that I've had other than students wanting to bring their phones over for whatever reasons. That's that's the biggest problem. Sure. It's more of a professional practice type of thing. It's a very collaborative um, discipline and they need to learn how to have that etiquette in critique and in presenting, so. Yeah, I mean, it sounds great. I mean, the only thing I would, and it sounds like you've already done it is just, um, Make sure you share that last statement with them. The reason your computer is not coming over is because of, you know, and all this stuff is available to you. And that might lessen the anxiety of the students because they're like, oh, I'm afraid I'll miss out on something. Yeah, and I, and I do, but that's a good reminder. Thank you. And I just kind of want to, I mean, a little different than what Pat said. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, I've learned with accessibility over the last several years is that sure students may get an accommodation and there's the few little bullet points this is what it is but one of the most valuable things that you can do is have a conversation with each student to discuss with them what the accommodations mean to them, what they would really like for accommodations. I've had students that's, you know, the accommodation says, you know, an alternate classroom, but they don't want to use that accommodation. They just want the ability to have maybe some extra time if they need it. Um, sometimes, you know, there's something that would really help them that's not rigorously written on the accommodation. 
and so when this would be kind of one of those examples um and so when we get a student that has that documented accommodation really a really crucial thing and even if it's undocumented as michael addressed when they open up to you or they come to you with some things that they would like to help them succeed in the course have the conversation with them and work out what what works best mm -hmm. and you know in your case the if the student recognizes that it really is primarily discussion and you don't need to be too focused on the actual content and that there's a, uh, a professional or um, etiquette component to this they might not be so concerned about having the computer with them right at that point um, you know but we all have different situations like this that occur and I think often we get it and say okay yeah whatever and move on and it it really is it's valuable to the student as well because it gives them some ownership it gives them some input and what you might end up realizing is that things that you're already doing fit for what they need or you know, as Michael discovered, well, just posting videos I already have as another source works and it might work for everybody. Um, and so I just, that's why I wanted to kind of jump in and add to what Pat commented about is in terms of have the discussion. Thank you, that's very helpful. Usually they just hand it to you and run away. <laughs> so I'll have to remember that to try to make it a point to um, yeah. have a discussion when it's it's at the right time. Yeah, sometimes it's a matter of getting them to office hours or yeah, but yeah, a lot of time it's data class here, I got this walk away. Yeah, is is a leaving out of the class they kind of throw it at you. It's like, oh, oh, yeah, here. <laughs> well, General Although, chatter, Casey, that that's a, a good, a good it should be good practice stuff. is that, that, that sounds like best practice. And And actually, they're all email now, right, Pat? So the simple thing to do is you get that email, forward it to the students, so they know you got it, and say, hey, I'd like to sit down and meet and talk to you about this. Amen. I think I've had it where they're usually CC'd on it anyway, right? I think you CC us and the student, and I just respond and say, thank you, what do you need? You know, what can I do for you type of thing? I think that's really helpful. I wanted to say thank you, Michael, for hosting this space um, in the conversation right now, because I think it, like Pat was saying, the more, the you know, the better. Um, working in EOP, we have a number of students who have, um, it's not even slipping through the cracks. <laughs> the system's just not, it, it's not supporting them prior to their time at Oswego. So they come in with really no documentation or, or over-documented, depending on the situation. Um, but uh, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we've been able to find too is that there are some really good resources, particularly for the students that we serve coming from urban areas of low income, uh, no cost testing if they are interested in getting tested, um, if they hadn't up until that point, not everyone is. But the other thing we've found some success in, and, and this is with the help of Pat and Star, is addressing the myths um, early on in our summer bridge program. And we start it with our peer leaders, so the student staff that are going to be working with the students. So they kind of know, um, you know, if you come in with an IEP or a 504 plan, you're not going to be put in a separate, quote unquote, special ed classroom. Right? Like You're going to be in the classroom with the rest of your peers. And here are some of the ways that the services can support you. Um, and, you know, I think that that's helped the, those conversations and students to feel more um, at ease about the stigma um, that they carry with them coming into SUNY with A lot of them still say, I don't, I want to try it by myself. I don't want to try with extra services first. <laughs> and then after their first semester, they're like, okay, maybe I should take extra time on tests. So, um, and uh, just going off of what Casey was just saying, and the thing that was running through my mind this entire time, the intentionality of the faculty to be accessible, to take the time to get to know the student, I think is the biggest point in all of this if um if we can take that time and I know it's hard when you have 150 students um it makes a huge difference in their experience here and elsewhere so thank you guys yeah for sure Grace one time I gave one of these Celt talks on the just the importance of learning names importance of learning names and strategies behind learning 100 names in a in a in a 15 week semester
Great. Well, thank you everyone for coming. And we are gonna log off and start the next session now. So thank you so much, Michael, for that. Thank you, Michael.